Well, yes, I'm on call this week. How could you tell? Today, I've got uh, an old, old piece of tech. Well, relatively old anyways, piece of tech to take a look at in the form of this. Oh, uh, hang on. This unit here. Um, this is a thing called the TAP 2000 from Hark Systems Wireless Communication Solutions. Um, this is a modem bank from a, uh, from a paging system. Um, these cards over here are dual modem cards. So we've got a total of eight modems. Um, these things operated at 2400 baud, which was because it was only receiving data from paging, from paging terminals. That's all you really need because the messages are going to be like shorter than a Twitter message. So you don't need huge, uh, huge amounts of uh, data coming in. And for the time, 2400 baud was perfectly acceptable. Um, now then there's 16 slots in this card cage. So, uh, oh, you got common cards over here. So you could put what a dozen of these dual modems in, um, these two cards are dual RS-232 serial port cards um, um in pra in operation these two were connected to other external modems uh, which were dedicated lines i think from like an answering service or something and this one was programmed as the output to the actual paging system and over here we have a controller card with a little serial port on it for maintenance so I'm going to yoink a uh, representative sample of these cards out onto the bench and get back to a normal viewing angle here. Okay, so we'll just take these in the order that they came out. Um, I guess the first thing that we notice on here is the copyright date, 1990. So that dates the, uh, the system pretty effectively. Though they are still making a, uh, a successor to this, surprisingly enough. When I went and found their website. Uh, so this first one is just a bus termination card. So when all these are plugged in to the back of that card cage, all the slots are in parallel on a data bus back here. Um, and there's, I guess, the eight bits of the data bus uh, on that terminating resistor. We've got some, a bunch of diodes and uh, whatnot. So that just keeps the bus uh, stable on the back plane at a stable impedance. Um, doesn't, and I guess those diodes are probably clamping the voltage, I am guessing. So I think most of those diodes are 1N1733. One one seven three three. I think that's what that says. Oh no, 1N4733. Three three. Okay. Okay, that's a 5 volt zener. I guess a 5 volt zener makes reasonable amount of sense for clamping the voltage on a, on a data bus board just to try and keep everything nice and tame and friendly. So not much to see on that one. Um... I guess any sort of a parallel bus system is going to have a termination of some sort on it. Here is one of the modem cards, one of the dual modem cards. Now I've, you see, I've covered up the asset tag so that you can't tell who this belonged to before they went bankrupt and were bought by another company who went bankrupt and were bought by a company that my company eventually bought. So the top half has, you know, one of those, one of those, one of those, and so does the bottom half. Um, so we've got some 7,400, uh, uh, logic chips back here. Um, nothing too fancy. Some custom, uh, custom EEPROM type chips there, maybe? Actually, there's the part number on the board, uh, MC68HC705C8. Because it's going to take forever if I go out and go and, uh, bop off to the computer every time for these chips, I've just look them up ahead of time and I'll just run you through what's on here. So the first thing on the back of here is this odd little uh, TIPAL16L8. These are programmable, well, normally, or these days you call them programmable logic arrays, but it calls a programmable array logic, which is an odd little chip. So y you don't really know what's going on inside there because it's programmable. We've got uh, this little, probably microcontroller of some sort. Um, and it's got the TAP2000 program on it. Uh, 74HC573, which is an 
octal uh, latch chip and another one uh, there and another one there another one there and another one there okay well that's easy enough um, then over here MC 74 HC 74 which are dual flip-flops um, got a couple of relays there some big power resistors and capacitors and stuff little six pin devices these are opto couplers or opto isolators whatever you prefer to call them uh, LM 3900 which is a quad op amp and then there's these things Zcom XE 2401L that is actually a 2400 baud modem in a box so as I said it's just a 2400 uh, BPS data modem um, phone line on one side TTL on the other side uh, TTL serial interface on the other side it can do 2400 or 1200 or 300 baud which is what the overall shelf is capable of doing as well uh, runs from a single 5 volt supply, which is a little surprising for telephony equipment, uh, especially stuff that interfaces directly with the with the telephone line, and it uses AT commands, which is really uh, really kind of neat. So you just treat it like an actual modem, and there is just a a basic circuit of how to how you can uh, use one in the low techest way possible. Um, there's the tip and ring coming from the phone line. Your serial stuff over here. Transmit data. Uh, where's the receive data? There it is. Receive data. Um, data terminal ready. Request to send. All the standard modemy goodness. So the other oddball thing on here that isn't just fairly standard is these little guys right here. Initially, I thought they were just an op amp or something, but when I looked them up, the LM567 is in fact a tone decoder, um, which can also be used as an oscillator. And I'm not sure exactly what they're using it for in this circuit. They might be detecting dial tone. I'm not sure. Uh, this application doesn't detect DTMF, so it's not that. Um, and all the modemy stuff is handled by these guys, so it's not that. So I'm not quite sure. Um, there are these pot, uh, potentiometers, nice little 10 turn jobbies, by the way, that are right handy to them. I haven't seen those guys before. I'm not, not sure what kind of a repurposing hackability they are. Um, the ringing signal is what 90 volts AC 20 Hertz, I think on the telephone line. I think that's right. So maybe that's the frequency that these guys are detecting. Hmm interesting so the next card along is this dual io card it's got two serial ports on the front and if i remember correctly they can go fairly fast um oh i mean relatively fast like 56k or something like that um i don't remember exactly but as i mentioned in the application where this thing was used there was two dedicated modems coming in like permanent uh uh, always on modems, not dial up modems coming directly from a couple of different telephone answering services who would uh, page their clients through this thing. So they, they had just a computer on the other end of that line where the least circuit, wherever it was. Um, and one of these, the other one of these cards had the output to the actual paging machine, which did all the uh, translating all this information into paging, uh, into like, uh, pox say or whatever, and triggering the transmitters and all that stuff. Um, that stuff's all way too big for me to bring in here and it's on its way to the scrap yard anyway. So on this guy, what do we have? Uh, this is that, uh, TAPAL 16 L eight again, which is that programmable logic array or programmable array logic. Um, all the cards seem to have that on it. So I'm not quite sure what that would be doing in this, in this instance. Yeah. So down here, uh, a couple of MC 74 HC 541s, which are eight bit or octal line buffers, uh, with tri-state outputs. So I guess they, uh, huh. Is that what's going on down there too? No. 
I guess they can, uh, the reason they're tri-state is so they can go on and off the bus here as needed. Um, when there's not data coming in, then they'll just take the card off the bus. So it's not loading it down and I guess allowing other things to, uh, to talk on the bus. Huh. There's an IRQ jumper here. So an interrupt request and I'm not sure NMI, I'm not sure what that is, but it looks like you can uh, tell this thing to interrupt the processor or not uh, through one of the pins on the back plane here. We have these two TDK chips. TDK, yes, the same company that made cassette tapes and recording tape and stuff. Uh, TDK 73 M550. Uh, I could not find any th information on these other than a couple of... Uh, uh, weird Chinese websites that just had that part number in the middle of a whole bunch of Chinese characters that I don't understand. I'm assuming there's some kind of a little processor or something, especially since they've both got little Chris, little 1.8 something meg crystals beside them. So that, that would be my guess there. And then up at the front, right before the, or right after, I guess the serial ports, with these Maxim Max 328, uh, chips which are actually RS-232 line driver chips. It's always interesting when you find a chip that's so ubiquitous that it's actually got its own Wikipedia page. Um, this, as I said, is an RS-232 serial port to TTL uh, driver. Um, the thing about RS-232, you know, the standard serial port that every computer and every dumb device or, you know, half-ass smart device for decades and decades had on it. The interesting thing is the actual RS-232 port uses a, uh, a bipolar power supply plus, uh, up to plus 15 volts and down to minus 15 volts to, uh, to drive the, uh, a nice long serial line. They don't have to be too, too fast. As a matter of fact, when you're getting really long ranges, if you slow down a little bit and crank up the voltage to uh, make up for line losses, you can go for ridiculously long distances. But anyway, that's kind of an aside. Um, the important point is the RS-232 port uh, can be up to 15 volts uh, above and below uh, ground your ground level. And the MAX-232 chip, cool thing about it is from a single-ended 5-voltage power supply, it can create those voltages inside itself. So here's, yeah, here's a quick application note. Here's the five volts input and it can create a plus and minus eight and a half volt supply from within it. Notice those are going out of the chip and then it's got CMOS or TTL line levels down here and the RS-232 input down here. But yeah, that's, I thought that was kind of cool that it can create its own uh, it has its own little power supply in it to create the higher voltages. That's pretty slick. That's a neat little board too. Um, and a cool little chip that's probably, well, I mean, like I said, given that it's got its own Wikipedia page, it's probably shown up all over the place in anything that's got serial ports, uh, in it that needs to come down to, uh, uh logic levels. And the last of the four cards in the thing is this guy, which is the control, uh, what do they call it? Standard bus CPU card. Okay. Um, so it's got a serial port on the front of it so that you can plug your laptop into it and program this thing or monitor it. And yep, another one of the Max 232 chips there to do that job. What is that? That is a relay. Why is there a relay there? I don't know. Anyway, there's a little relay there. There's a processor reset button, of course. There is the processor, Motorola MC68HC11F1C, uh, F1C, FN4. But yeah, it's, it's a microcontroller that's, that's in charge of this whole thing. Um, what are some of these other chips? Ah, there's a little lithium battery. That's it. That holds its memory. And it's, it looks like it's in a dip package. Can I pull that out and make this thing lose its memory? Probably. Oh yeah, it'll come eventually. I don't, don't feel like doing that too badly though. And what else have we got over here? 
That is a TL7705, which is a low voltage supervision chip. So that basically hold, monitors the voltage and holds this thing in a reset state until the voltage is above a, whatever threshold it's programmed for uh, with probably this little Zener diode right here. Um, so that just makes sure that the, uh, the chip has nice stable voltage before it lets it start moving and doing its magic. Down here again, back onto the bus, another one of those uh, 74HC541s, which is that tri-state octal line buffer again. Um, we have some prom, uh, looks like an EEPROM there, which has all of its software on it. And this guy here is MS62256L, which... What did my lookup say on that? That's a 32K 8-bit static RAM. So that's uh, that's giving this guy a whole bunch more RAM to play with other than its uh, 1K internal. And I think that's oh, what's going on under this little sticker here. I didn't look at that one earlier. Blink. Okay, that's another one of those programmable logic array, programmable array logic chips that we saw on all the other ones. And in here, we have a whole bunch of terminating resistors all over everything. Um, eight bits wide, just to keep the buses nice and terminated and happy. And then, of course, the crystal that's running this guy. Looks like there's a provision for some kind of a daughter board up here that they obviously don't have populated. They're kind of nice little boards, though. I like that. Anyway, so there's all the smarts of the thing. Now there's one other thing going on in, on the back plane, there's a power supply. So there's the back plane itself. Um, this, uh, this connector here went out to the telephone lines. It just fanned out onto a uh, punch box. The telephone lines came in there on that little ribbon cable, so that power coming onto the board there. Yeah. So the power is just being fed into the bus in two different places and up through this guy here to the little power module on the back plane. I'm gonna pull a few screws and get at that. One nice thing about dealing with professional grade equipment is it's intended to be taken apart and repaired. So with just undoing that ribbon cable and that power connector and four screws, I was able to get this whole back panel off where the power supply lives. Um, so this thing is mains powered as you can tell. Um, well, if you couldn't tell before, you can tell now. Um, one amp fuse on there. Nice chunky solid switch. There's some opto optional connectors uh, for this thing for expanding it, which were options that presumably were never bought. Uh, and the power supply is held in with these two screws here. Oddly, they are straight blade screws. Everything else has been Phillips so far. Okay, there is our little power supply, which is made for them by TDK. Again, yes, the same TDK that made your cassette tapes back when this thing was made. Um, input 120 volts, 1.2 amps. Interesting that it's only got a one amp fuse on it. So they are overrating their power supply for what they need. That's good. And the output is 5 volts at 10 amps. Oh. When this thing goes back to the scrap pile at work for its serial number to be recorded before it uh, heads off to wherever, to the shredder, um, it might be a little bit lighter. You never know when you're going to need a 10 amp 5 volt power supply. Wow. Um, got a little adjustment pot there. Got a little red LED there, line input, uh, live neutral and ground, and then your five volts output. Wowzers. Well, that was a fun little teardown. Interesting to see what was going on on these, uh, on these boards back in the nineties. Um, this serial board has a 1996 date code on it which is, I think, the most modern of the ones that I've... Yeah, 96. Uh, that one's 1990. Yeah, so uh, um, mid-90s uh, tele telephony technology, specifically a 2400 baud modem bank. 
that could have handled up to um, 12 dual modem cards and actually 14 dual modem cards probably and or some other mix of these serial port cards mix and match put them wherever you want as long as you tell the controller card where everything is and what they're set up for and what their speeds are and stuff uh yeah it was uh it was a neat little box and quite honestly it was a lot more stable than what came before it um i don't remember in the decade or so that i was babysitting this thing I don't remember once having to replace a card or even reboot it really, except for when we were making a configuration change or something. So yeah, it's a, a neat old piece of technology and from a company that still exists and is still making, um, stuff for, well, telecommunications equipment, um, really niche stuff, uh, stuff that like, yeah, like three digit serial numbers. Um, that's the kind of niche level that these guys are doing. I'll put a link to their website down in the comments uh, or down in the description. If you care to take a look at them and just take a look at some of this uh, little esoteric stuff from a small little company that probably almost all of you hadn't heard of. I certainly wouldn't have heard of them had I not had this stuff uh, in a rack that I've been staring at, like I said, for the last decade. Anyway, well, thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. Questions and comments down below as usual. I will talk to you later. And now I have to get this all back together and put it back into the scrap pile before somebody notices. Bye.